everyone and welcome to week six of an introduction to paleontology with the Safe Cultural Heritage Group. This week's topic is on human evolution. So this is all the like hominin species up until present day Homo sapiens. <laughs> we will be learning about what human evolution is, the key dates, paleogeography and paleoclimate, evolutionary trees, so that includes key fossils and key localities, as well as major evolutionary events including bipedalism, tool use and human dispersals. Quite plainly, what is a human? A human is anyone who belongs in the genus Homo. Homo sapiens are the only extant species of the Homo genus um, and so Homo sapiens are what we are today. You might also hear us be called anatom anatomically modern humans and it's thought that well it's known that Homo first evolved in Africa as well as much of human evolution occurred on that continent. So the evolutionary history of the genus Homo was um, roughly only five to seven million years ago, with Homo sapiens emerging at around 300,000 years ago. It's been, there have been many, many debates as um, to what makes Homo sapiens different from the other apes. So these debates kind of have been going on since the 1800s. And the evolution is, of humans is not as simple as the image on the right, um, as there are much more branches and offshoots, um, kind of with some species causing, well not causing, leading to other species that don't directly link to humans, modern humans, um, meaning that human evolution is not as clear cut as we would like. The distinguishing features of the genus Homo um, include bipedality, the large and complex brains, which is what we kind of have, which have led to large skulls. This enables then for the development of advanced tools, culture and language. There's um, a smaller amount of sexual dimorphism, so when we talk about sexual dimorphism that means that sometimes the males are larger than the females or vice versa. It's just a general size difference between the two sexes. Um, there's also the ulna opposition and this is where you can touch the tip of your pinky finger with the thumb in the same hand um, and that means that that is a distinguishing feature. Um, we also have more of a concept of childhood, as well as smaller canine teeth. At the beginning, so let's talk about apes. Apes include gibbons, chimpanzees, gorillas, bonobos, orangutans and humans as well as all the species that led up to humans. And when we talk about apes we have the hominoids which include the great apes which include chimpanzees, gorillas, bonobos and orangutans as well as humans. And apes were at the most abundant in the Miocene and they were and are still native to Africa and Southeast Asia. Um, what separates apes from monkeys is that they are tailless, um, they have a wider degree of freedom of motion at the shoulder joint which is excellent and evolved for arm swinging and all bar us and the gorillas are excellent tree climbers. They um, Hominoids diverged from the old world monkeys roughly 25 million years ago. Gibbons, which are more basal, split from the rest of us at about 18 million years ago. And the hominid, which include the kind of um, orangutans, split at around... Um, so the split between orangutans and the hominids split at around 14 million years ago. Seven million years ago, um, the gorillas split off. And then at around three to five million years ago, human... well, homos and chimpanzees um, diverge from each other. 
look quickly look at the cladogram. So apes include the humans, chimpanzees and bonobos, gorillas, orangutans and gibbons, whereas the great apes include the humans, um, chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas and orangutans, excluding the gibbons. And then the hominoids include the great apes and the humans. Homininidae, um, we think of the hominids as closer to humans than to gorillas and chimpanzees. Hominid, the hominididae includes orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees and humans, but does not include gorilla, uh, gibbons. And morphology and molecular studies indicate that humans are more closely related to chimpanzees, while gorillas are the more distant and orangutans are even more distant from us. And I think humans and chimps share roughly 98.8% of their DNA, which is just incredible. Is a, another cladogram. So within the um, hominoidea, which is the superfamily, we can split into the hylobatidae, which include the gibbons, and the hominoididae, which include the ponginae, which include orangutans, and the homininae, which include the gorillas, and the homininis, which include homo and pan, which include humans and chimpanzees. I'll talk about the homininae. Um, hopefully I've not put enough ends in there. Um, it's the subfamily of the hominidae, hominidae and there are two tribes with their extant as well as extinct species. So the first one is the tribe hominini which has the genus homo and the pan um, nia which is represented by the genus pan which includes chimpanzees and bonobos and then you've also got the tribe gorillini which includes the gorillas and it also includes the extinct tribe of the drypithecines which we can see on the um, right here the species um, drypithecus. Drypithecus was a um, genus of great apes from the middle to late Miocene um, roughly 12.5 to 11.1 million years ago and they've been found in Europe. The program is kind of in its own weird one, it keeps getting moved around. Um, it's, it's thought to be either an offshoot of orangutans, an offshoot of the African apes such as the gorillas and chimpanzees and bonobos, or it could be its own separate branch. So it's just kind of a one that gets moved around a lot. Here we have another cladogram, which focuses in more on the hominidae, which include the gorillas and the um, homo. Now we'll go on to the hominidae timeline. So hominidae ancestors separate from um, the ancestors of orangutans roughly 18 to 14 million years ago, which is during the Miocene. And the clade with the humans and the chimpanzees and bonobos split from the ancestors of gorillas at roughly 10 to 8 million years ago and then the latest common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees is estimated to have lived roughly 10 to 5 million years ago. There are a couple of late Miocene um, basal members of the hominins and their existence suggests that the hominine diverged from the hominids no earlier than 8 million years ago. So we have um, Necolipithecus and Oranopithecus. Um, Lipithecus was found from roughly um, in the Tortonian during the Miocene, which was roughly 9.9 .9 to 9.8 million years ago during the late Miocene. Uh, it's known from a right jawbone with only three molars as well as 11 isolated teeth. Um, and it's thought that it might have lived within a woodland environment and it was found in Kenya. Pithecus was um, a Eurasian great ape from Greece and Turkey. And um, these are found in the Miocene rocks dating to 9.6 to um, 9.7 years ago, uh, 9.7 million years ago. Um, and it's thought that Oranopithecus was actually more likely to be a dry pithecine um, and more closely related to the Pongine. So again, we it's one of those ones that we thought was ancient human species but more likely to be within the hominin kind of outer groups 
let's now move on to the evolutionary line that leads to us. There have been as many as 22 different species along this line, um, four of which are um, pre-Australopiths, nine are Australopiths, and nine are hum um, Homo. And the earliest humans are thought to be from the Pliocene, um, however, new finds that um, were found in the 2000s push this back to the Miocene, which was rough, rough, roughly somewhere between six to seven million years ago. And um, we have, for example, the late Miocene um, African example of Sahel Anthropus, as well as Aurorin. And here we see this lovely picture of human skulls of evolutionary ancestors up into today's anatomically modern humans. Sahel Anthropus chadensis um, was discovered in 2001 and it was found in Chad, which is in West Central Africa, hence the um, kind of species name being chadensis. And it lived somewhere between seven to six million years ago in the Miocene. And um, the, the fossil is a distorted, nearly complete cranium, as well as fragmentary lower jaws, so the um, dentary. And um, the skull shows a mixture of both primitive and advanced characters. For example, um, the brain size would have been very similar to a chimpanzee's, whereas the canine teeth are small, which are similar to pro present humans, as well as a prominent brow ridge, as you can see on um, this lovely fossil here, which is only seen in the genus Homo. As well as this, they also had a foramen magnon, which um, is kind of this bit here on the skull and it's posterior um, positioned anteriorly as well as being orthogonal um, suggesting that the um, there is an upright posture which meant that it could have been habitually bipedal which is really cool. Aurorin um, togensis was discovered again in 2001 and it's thought to have lived somewhere in central Kenya in Eastern Africa, so that's where the fossils were first found. And it's thought to have lived sometime between 6.2 and 5.8 million years ago, which again is during the Miocene. And we know about this species, um, and as well as this genus, from teeth, mandible fragments, as well as a broken limb bone. Um, and overall, over 20, well, only 20 fossils have been found so far. And the teeth are extremely ape-like, whereas the femur, which is the leg bone, uh, the big leg bone, suggests that Aurorin could have been habitually bipedal. Whereas the rest of the postcranian body, so that includes from kind of neck down, <laughs> um, it indicates they climbed in trees. And the arm bone that has been found suggests that it was also able to swim through, the, uh, swing, not swim, swing through the trees. And Aurorin has more ape-like features than human features. Now we will move on to Ardipithecus ramidus. And this was first discovered in 1994. And we found them in... Um, the Middle Awash in Gona, which is in Ethiopia, um, which is again in Eastern Africa. And Ardipithecus lived around 4.4 million years ago, which is the early Pliocene. So we're coming forward in time. And we know about Ardipithecus um, from roughly 110 fossils, which includes a partial female skeleton, which is just amazing. Um, Ardipithecus has a small face with large canines and quite narrow molars. As well as this, it had a more forwardly placed foramen magnum, which again suggests they stood upright. Um, Ardipithecus had adaptations for both bipedality as well as orborality, which means they lived both in the trees and could have walked on two legs. Um, however, it wouldn't have really been as efficient with the bipedality as humans, but it wasn't as a efficient at uh, arborality as the non-human great ape, so the orangutans and the chimpanzees, um, yeah, the orangutans and the chimpanzees, which is really cool, and it's just kind of a weird mix of both. <laughs> it's 
So we will now move on to the Australopiths, which is kind of what everyone really knows as kind of the basal members of the humans um, species. And they are early hominins which flourished during the Pliocene. Um, so we most know about the Australopiths because of Australopithecus. Um, and it is a really long ranging genus. So 4.1 to 1.4 million years ago. So this is from the late Pliocene to the early Pleistocene. And there have been multiple different species. Um, and Australopiths include Homo, which include the modern humans, Pananthropus, um, and Kenyanthropus, which evolved from the Australopithecus. And these are in all kind of a paraphyletic group. And Australopiths share several traits with modern apes and humans and were more widespread throughout Eastern and Northern Africa by 3.5 million years ago. And it's thought that some species of Australopiths could fully walk upright. And the first fossil of an Australopith was um, found by a, um, a man called Raymond Dart in 1925. And it was a small child's skull from um, Tung in South Africa. And this dated to roughly 2.5 to 3 million years ago. Two forms of um, Australopiths that are the gracile, uh, gracile and the robust. So the gracile include um, Australopithecus um, anamensis, Australopith afarensis, Australopithecus um, africanus, Australopithecus gari and Afri um, Australopithecus sediba and um, the robust are kind of also within um, known as the Pananthropus and um, they are Pananthropus robustus, Pananthropus um, athipithecus and Pananthropus boisei and we can tell the difference between the two forms because there is um, difference in the cranial capacity, differences in the shape of the brain case, differences in molar size. For example, um, the robust, so the Pananthropus, had really large molars and had um, quite strongly built mandibles. And um, they is general. Um, they had a general robustness of bones throughout the body, and that's why they're called the robust forms as well as there being a lot of dietary differences um the robust could eat tough vegetable foods whereas the gracile would only eat more of a varied diet and there's quite a lot of disagreement about the proper taxonomy between the gracile and the robust and it will forever be changing <laughs> so um here are a few examples of the differences as you can see in this really great diagram here from um, Flegel 1999 as well as Lewin and Foley 2003 um, and you can see here that the Australopithecus is kind of more compact I would say in terms of skull size whereas the Paranthropus is a lot bigger and broader and you can see the difference in the cheek teeth. So Australopithecus anamensis. It was first discovered in 1995 and it's thought to have lived in Lake Takana, well not in, around Lake Takana in Kenya, as well as the Middle Awash in Ethiopia, which is in Eastern Africa. And it's um, lived around 4.2 to 3.8 million years ago during the Pliocene. And it's the oldest known Australopithecus species um, with nearly 100 fossil specimens being found, which represents roughly 22 individuals. Um, so we were talking about Australopithecus afarensis and it's thought that Australopithecus anamensis and afarensis lived um, possibly side by side for each other at least um, for a small period of time um, during kind of towards the end of anamensis's temporal reign, uh, range sorry and this is from evidence of a um, new cranium which is this bit here which was found in 2019 which kind of pushed the age of Anamensis's temporal range forwards a bit and um, with Anamensis the upper end of the tibia shows an expanded area of bone and it had a human-like orientation of the um, ankle joint which indicates kind of regular bipedal walking 
And it's thought that Anamensis was also um, most likely to be a plant eater, relying on um, both fruits as well as tough fruit uh, foods such as nuts to live. Now we will go on to Australopithecus afarensis, which is probably the most famous um, Australopithecus found. Um, it was discovered in 1974, and it's um, it's been found in Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania, um, all of which are in Eastern Africa. Kind of just as a side note, Eastern Africa is just like this hot spot for human evolution. It's just an amazing location. And um, it's thought to have lived around 3.85 to 2.95 million years ago, which is during the Pliocene. And um, there are roughly remains from more than 300 individuals found. Um, with And Australopithecus afarensis was around 1, point, um, 1 to 1 1.2 metres tall. It had a generally ape-like face, um, quite long arms, but short legs. And... Um, the hind limbs, so the um, legs basically, and um, the pelvic structure suggests adaptations for bipedalism and the jawbone was quite robust. And it's thought that um, Australopithecus afarensis was also sexually dimorphic with the females being a lot shorter and smaller than the males. And the most famous fossil hominin that um, if you ask anyone to name a kind of fossil hominin they would say lucy which is um a um fossil hominin which of Afren um, australopithecus afarensis and it's roughly 40 percent complete and there are also other specimens known um for example we have um the first family which is kind of like a lot of australopithecus afarensis fossils that were found together and some were really small and some were you know a bit older um, there's also these amazing fossil footprints of Australopithecus afarensis, which you can see in the bottom here. Um, and these were found in Laetoli, which is a like an ash deposit. And oh my, they're just stunning because it shows that they were definitely bipedal. And you've also got the um, child specimen, um, which is also known as the Dicaca skeleton. And it's just, they're just amazing fossils. <laughs> Some of the later Australopiths, um, include as many as seven different species. Um, for example, Africanus, Gari, Sedaba, um, bah, um, Bahrel, Ghazali, and then you've also got the Pananthropus robustus, Aethopithecus, as well as Boise. And um, another species that's kind of broadly considered within this group of later Australopiths were the Kenyathropus um, platypus, Platyops, sorry, which was um, around 3.3 million years ago. And this was from um, Loam Kui in Kenya. And it's known from a crushed and distorted skull, as well as possibly um, two partial jaw bones and some teeth. And Kenyan Thropus had small teeth and it's possibly got adaptations of both robust and gracile Australopiths. Um, however, some people think it might just be a distorted specimen of Australopithecus afarensis. So, these later Australopiths um, show advances over the um, older Australopiths. So, for example, flattening of the face, a loss of diastema, so the, teeth, the gap between teeth, as well as quite small canine teeth, which is what we have today. Pananthropus um, was first discovered in 1938 and um, found in the Takana Basin of northern Kenya, which is in, um, as well as in southern Ethiopia, again, all of which were in eastern Africa, and it's thought to have lived between 2.6 and 0.6 million years ago, which suggests that um, it coexisted with some early human species, which include um, Australopithecus afarensis, um, Africanus, sorry, Homo habilis, and as well as Homo erectus, which is just so cool to think that um, there was just multiple different human species all kind of living together at once. And um, Par Paranthropus had broad faces, as well as huge molars and premolars, and they also had this really nice sagittal crest. So as you can see on the skull here, just kind of this bit here, it's um, known as a sagittal crest. And this is kind of where muscles for the jaw bones attach to and it suggests um, adaptations for chewing tough plant food and it's thought that Paranthropus was 
um, one of the first hominin taxis to routinely go out into the open grassland areas, so into the savannas almost. Um, so yeah, it's just so cool. We will go into the first homo species. Um, so we'll be talking about Homo habilis. And this was first discovered in 1964, and it has been found in eastern and southern Africa, and lived between 2.4 and 1.4 million years ago, which is the early Pleistocene. And it's the oldest species of our genus, so it's the oldest member of the Homo spe uh, genus. Sorry, Homo habilis literally translates to handyman <laughs> and it was um on average a height of 100 to 100, um, 135 centimeters as well as an average weight of 32 um, kilograms um there's also evidence of tool making in homo habilis and um, this is known as the um Aldowan sto uh, stone tool industry as we can see in the bottom here that is the um an, an Olawodan, um chopper and it's thought that these tools were mainly used for butchering and this has been found as there have been cut marks which have been found on animal fossils um so like the prey species would have cut marks that are indicative of stone tools being used but um the age of these mean they was homo habilis um it also retains primitive features that le uh, that kind of link it to australopithecus and australopithecus and Homo habilis and Homo erectus um, coexisted in Eastern Africa for almost half a million years alongside Homo rudolfensis and um, Paranthropus boisei. Now we will move on to Homo rudolfensis and this was first discovered in 1986 and it's been found in northern Kenya as well as possible northern Tanzania and Malawi which is in eastern Africa and it's um, lived around 1.9 to 1.8 million years ago which means it's in the Pleistocene so again we've gotten closer towards present day and um, it's only known from a skull fossil um, as no postcranial remains that have been definitively assigned to Rudolfensis um, have been found, which means that the size um, assessment could be quite difficult. And it has a larger mean brain case size, um, which is on the upper end of the Homo habilis brain case size, um, but it's more primitive than the other skull characteristics. Um, and it's thought that it had a larger body size, again, we're not really sure, but it's argued that this species is actually just a male Homo habilis specimen. <laughs> Um, however, some people also recommend that it's actually an Australopithecus um, or a Kenyanthropus or that it's um, actually just Homo habilis. So it's kind of taxonomically just a mess, in, if I can put that in a nice way. So yeah, it's, it's one of those ones that will be constantly moved around. Homo erectus is probably one of the more famous of the um, fossil humans um well the extinct human species and it was first discovered in 1891 which is kind of quite old for a human fossil to be found um it's been found in northern eastern and southern africa in western asia um as well as east asia and it's thought to have well it did live around 1.89 to a million years ago to 110 thousand years ago and it's the first widespread human. It's the first human species to be found outside of Africa. So it's been found in Europe and in Asia. And it's the first of our relatives to have more human-like body proportions. So a protruding brow ridge, a large face and no chin. Um, it also had adaptations for life lived on the ground, which um, means that it's had a lot of tree climbing adaptations. And it's often associated with the earliest hand axes. Homo ergaster was discovered in 1975 and fossils have been found um, in eastern and southern Africa and it lived between 1.7 and 1.4 million years ago. And it was first proposed to be a new species in 1975 after scientists re-examined um, a fossil jaw which was previously identified as Homo habilis and um, Homo agaster is easily distinguished between um, 
more earlier and basal species of Homo, including um, Habilis and Rudolfensis. And this is because the teeth and the jaws of Homo agaster are quite smaller, like relatively smaller than those of Habilis and Rudolfensis, which indicates a major change in diet. And um, the most famous example of Homo agaster is um, known as Tacana boy, which we'll be talking about in the next slide. And most fossils of um, this is because probably most fossils have been found along the shores of Lake Tacana in Kenya. And it's thought that Homo agaster should be put into the Homo erectus um, like line um, because um, there's too little to different. Uh, differentiate between the two to separate them into di uh, distinct species. So again, it's kind of like a taxonomic mess in the human um, evolutionary um, cladogram. It is um, a nearly complete skeleton and it's thought to have lived between 1.5 to 1.6 million years ago and it um, estimates have revealed that the individual's age at death was roughly 7 to 11 years old. And the fossils showed a lumbar disc herniation, um, which is thought to have been um, possibly why the specimen died. And it also had a diseased mandible. Now we will move on to Homo nalidi, which was discovered in 2015. So it's quite recently discovered. And it was found in southern um, South Africa. And it's it lived 335,000 years ago to 236,000 years ago. And the placement of where Homo nalidi is on the evolutionary tree is currently unresolved. And um, it's because it, although it's young for a species, it still displays primitive characteristics, which is found um, in fossils about 2 million years old, which is um, a quote taken from Professor Chris Stringer, who um, works on human um, the evolution of humans. And um, Homo nalidi possesses a mixture of traits that are quite Australopithecus-like, um, which is kind of particularly found in the pelvis and the shoulder regions. And then um, traits that are also homo-like, which include the hands and the feet, as well as the size of its brain. So it was first found in 2015, which is still quite recent. And this was found in um, a cave in South Africa, um, which is known as the Rising Star Cave. And there are um, 1,550 specimens, which kind of relate to at least 15 different homo nalidi individuals. And then um, additionally to this, 133 Homo nalidi specimens um, have been, were found in the um, kind of, in a different cave, chamber of the cave, um, which represents at least another three individuals which were found in 2013. So um, these individuals were found first um, and they were kind of still kind of debating where it was and then these ones were found in 2015 and it kind of cemented where they were. Anatomically, Homo nalidi um, is suggested to have walked on two legs with quite a modern gait, so kind of how we would walk. But they were a bit more arboreal than other Homo species as they were better adapted for climbing as well as suspensory behaviour in the trees. I'll move on to one of my absolute favourite um, Homo species, Homo floriensis. And this was discovered in 2003 and they are um, they are only found in the um, Liang Bao cave in the on the Isle of Flores in, individ um, in individual Indonesia and it's thought to have lived around a hundred thousand to fifty thousand years ago so this is quite late in the Pleistocene and um, we kind of call ho um, Homo floriensis they've been nicknamed the Hobbit after um, kind of the um the people who found them um so basically they're oh, fuck's sake. <laughs> so now we will now move on to one of my absolute favorite um species in our evolutionary line we are talking about homo floriensis and this was um you might know them as they've been nicknamed the hobbit and this is because they are really short in stature. Um, they 
were um, they range from roughly 0.9 to 1.1 meters in height, and um, they were kind of nicknamed the Hobbits after um, J.R.R. Tolkien's um, Hobbits from the Lord of the Rings season um, season series. <laughs> However, in October 2012, the New Zealand's um, were the New Zealand scientists that kind of discovered it um, were told by the Tolkien estate that they were not allowed to use the word hobbit. So um, they're just sort of now known as Homo floriensis. And they were first discovered in 2003. Um, and they were in the found in the Lingboa cave in on the Isle of Flores in Indonesia. And it, they lived around 100,000 to 50,000 years ago. So this is quite late in the Pleistocene. Like our, um, we could have possibly seen them. And um, Homo floriensis had smaller brain capacity, they had smaller teeth, they didn't have a chin, and they had differences with the humeral head. Um, it's thought that the skeleton that they found, so they found as many as 12 different individuals from the skeletal um, material, and it's thought that this skeleton might have had Down syndrome, um, and that the remains were... Um, of the other individuals at the fluorocyte were just merely normal anatomically modern humans. Um, but this has since been shut down because there are a number of characteristics shared by both individuals as well as um, other known early humans which are absent in Homo, Floria, um, Homo sapiens. And um, it isn't that they've got Down syndrome at all. Um, but the small size is thought to have possibly been due to insular dwarfism. So this is where um, organisms that are isolated maybe on like an island for example um can either become gigantic or dwarf so for example homo floriensis would have been the dwarf species of a human and um there's debate as to where it fits on the evolutionary tree and um how it's related to the other species of the genus homo and it's thought that, um, well, it's known that they had stone tools that were being manufactured and used. So the disappearance of Homo floriensis coincides with um, the Homo neanderthals extinction in Europe um, roughly 40,000 years ago. And this is kind of within 5,000 years after the arrival of modern, anatomically modern humans on the Isle of Flores. We have a, another example of um, sort of a island um, human. So we have um, Homo luzonensis and this was um, discovered in 2010 but it was first published about in 2019 so again quite a recently discovered well written about um, human and it lived on the island of Luzon which is in the Philippines and it lived roughly um, 0.067 to 0.05 million years ago, so um, in the late Pleistocene. And it's identified from a total of around seven teeth, as well as six small bones, which include the toe bones. And the teeth look quite similar to those of modern humans, and the foot bones are morphologically unique among Homo, but they are um, indistinguishable from those of the Australopithecus africanus and Australopithecus afarensis. So it's kind of weird because they have a presence of both traits of modern humans as well as Australopithecus, which is kind of weird, you know. Um, and Luzon has, the island of Luzon has always been an island, so during the Pleistocene. So um, again, the, their small size is thought to have been due to insular dwarfism. And it's actually kind of debated whether the species ancestors rafted there accidentally or they were, act um, they were actively exploring the Philippine region. Now move on to um, Homo antecessor, and um, they were first discovered in 1994, and it, was, um, it lived in Western Europe, and it lived roughly 1.2 million years ago to 800,000 years ago in the early Pleistocene. Um, and it's... Um, Roughly a million years ago, Homo antecessor spread via the Middle East into Europe, and it's um, been it was first recorded from the um, Sierra de Apopueca in Spain, and is known from the Grandolina Cave, and um, 
Then again, in Europe, Homo antecessor then evolved into Homo heidelbergensis, who were the ancestors of the um, what we know as Neanderthals. And um, the um, antecessor material that dates to 800,000 um, years ago was assigned to Homo antecessor, as it was the first hominins to have ranged into Western Europe. And outside of Spain, um, the only other evidence of Homo antecessor is actually here in Britain. Um, and it's the there are 50 footprints that have been ha found on Haysborough, which is in England, and it's a beach. And it dates to roughly 1.2 million to 800k, um, 800,000 years ago. And it's attributed to... Um, these footprints have been um, attributed to a Homo antecessor group because it was the only species that were kind of in Europe at the time. Um, and it's um, thought that Homo antecessor is the last common ancestor to Neanderthals and anatomically modern humans. Um, however, so in 2017, a study was found that um, Homo antecessor may not have been an ancestor of anatomically modern humans, but probably split, split from the branch quite shortly before the anatomically modern human and Neanderthal split. Heidelbergensis was discovered in 1908 and it lived in Europe as well as possibly Asia as well as Africa in Eastern and Southern Africa. And it lived between 0.7 and 0.2 million years ago, so the middle Pleistocene. Um, it, the, the first fossil of Homo heidelbergensis was first found in Germany, and this was known from a dentary, so the mandible. And it's the first early human species to live in much colder climates. Um, so Homo heidelbergensis had a very large brow ridge, which we can find here on the slide. Um, on the skull, for example, it also had a larger brain case and a flatter face, and they also had quite short, wide bodies. And um, Homo heidelbergensis lived at a time of the oldest definite control of fire, as well as use of wooden spears, um, for example, these on the right. And it was the first species to build shelters, as well as creating simple dwellings out of wood and rock. And um, as well as this, the Homo Heidel Heidelberg ensis was the first species to routinely hunt large animals. So, for example, um, around that time, it would have been like the mammoths, um, woolly rhinos, for example. And evidence for this comes from um, roughly 400,000 years ago. Um, these wooden spears, which again are on the right here, which were found in Schoengen in Germany. Um, and these are just really lovely examples of early human um, technology. However, these spears could also be attributed to early Neanderthals, so it's kind of debated as to which species um, made these spears. So the um, Middle Pleistocene, um, this is just kind of a key thing, is often termed the muddle in the middle, and this is because the species level of classification of um, ancient human remains from this period has been heavily debated so it kind of where the um in the middle pleistocene these species could be attributed to this or this or this comparison of neanderthal and anatomically modern human dna suggests that the two lineages diverged from a common ancestor which is most likely to be homo heidelbergensis sometime between 350,000 years ago and 400 um, 400,000 years ago and with the, um, so because Heidelbergensis has been found in Europe and Africa, the European branch led to um, Homo neanderthal um, lensis, so the Neanderthals, and the African branch led to Homo sapiens. And a key locality for Homo heidelbergensis is known as Boxgrove in Sussex, which is in England. And this is where a tibia and two teeth were discovered, as well as flint artifacts and animal remains, um, which show um, like cut marks from these flint artifacts. I'll move on to um, another one of my favourites, Homo neanderthalensis, which we will just call the Neanderthals. And they were first discovered in 1829 and they have been found across Europe and Southwest and Central Asia. Um, and they lived roughly between 40, um, 400,000 to 40,000 years ago. And it's thought that kind of the general consensus of Neanderthals were that they were 
dim, slow brutes. They were primitive. They were cavemen. Um, however, this isn't the case, um, which we will go on to talk about. And they are our closest extinct human relative. Um, fossils, so morph um, morphological and genetic evidence, suggests that we evolved from a common ancestor between 700,000 and 300,000 years ago. And they were the first hominin species to be named. And it's thought that Neanderthals most likely went extinct due to the assimilation of the um, modern human genome. So they were kind of bred into extinction because um, they bred with us. So um, it's kind of like a, a well-known fact that um, anatomically modern humans who um, outside of Africa have roughly two to, I think, 6% Neanderthal genes. Um, they also possibly went extinct due to climate change, disease, or just a general combination of all these different factors. But the characteristics between humans and Neanderthals. So Neanderthals have a long, low skull um, with a characteristic prominent brow ridge above their eye. Um, so the eyebrows would have kind of stuck out a bit more. The central part of the face um, was a bit more forward and it had a quite a big wide nose. <laughs> um, they didn't really have much of a chin. They also had larger teeth when compared to what we have. They had also wide hips and shoulders, as well as shorter lower e uh, legs and lower arm bones. And it's all thought that these were adaptations for colder climates, such as the ones that we get in Europe. There's recently a um, BBC documentary that was out on like kind of recreating a Neanderthal and it was just really good. I would definitely recommend watching it. And um, it's thought, which is where this picture is kind of from, it's thought that if you shaved Neanderthal and put them into modern clothes, like they've done in this picture here, they would pass completely unnoticed. Like you could be walking in the street, you look at this person and go, oh, I really like their outfit. And then just carry on and you wouldn't know that they were a Neanderthal because they are very similar to what we would look like Neanderthals developed this technology known as Mousterian technology and um, this was in the latter part of the uh, Middle Paleolithic which is also known as the Old Stone Age. So this is kind of where paleontology and archaeology kind of merge quite nicely and um, Mousterian technology lasted roughly from, um, well the Old Stone Age lasted roughly from 160,000 to 40,000 years beyond present. And we know that there were 60 plus different tool types that have been produced by Neanderthals. And this involves this really cool napping technique known as Lavalwa. And a napping technique is where you get a stone and you kind of hit it with a, um, another rock to create these edges. And um, so with the Lavalwa, a striking platform is formed at one end of the core, so the rock's edges and are trimmed off by flaking pieces around the outline of the um, like the lithic flake that you'd like, um, which creates like this domed shape on the side of the core. And then when the striking platform is hit, the flake separates from the lithic core. And then um, this flake is really sharp because of the different trimmings. And this flake could be used for anything, you know, like, um, skinning an animal it could be used as on a spear to kill an animal it could be used for anything it was so it, really cool technique what were kind of neanderthals like um archaeological evidence shows that neanderthals looked after their sick and they buried their dead which is really lovely to think of because quite a lot of the public's perception of neanderthals were that they were these hunter gatherers big dumb didn't really care about anything um, so an example of this is in a cave called Shanadar in Iraq and Shanadar 1 is this specimen of a Neanderthal and he has um, a disabled arm. He also had deafness as well as head trauma which probably meant that he was partially blind and scientists estimated that he lived to about 35 to 45 years old which is considered quite old for a, um, for a Neanderthal and it's thought that Shanadar 1 probably couldn't have lived um, without the care of his social group. So with all these disabilities that he did have, it's most likely that on his own he would just wouldn't survive. Whereas if he was in a group and they all cared for each other and kind of showed this social group, 
they he would have been able to survive to the age that he did. Um, so Neanderthals are known to have fashioned jewellery. And um, an example of this were out of eagle talons. And um, the oldest example of this jewellery um, was roughly 130,000 years old. And um, this is this really lovely um, eagle talon necklace, um, which was found in present day Croatia. And these eagle talons had notches and they were polished and they smoothed, um, they had cut marks that were smoothed out so it looked more presentable and this was used as jewellery. And alongside these really lovely eagle talons, um, we would have, we found also Neanderthals would have pierced animal teeth and worked ivory, so like from woolly mammoths, um, which would have been used to make jewellery. And um, Neanderthals produced art, which kind of wasn't really thought of to be a um, Neanderthal thing, really. Um, you know, a lot of people thought, oh, cave paintings were just from uh, like early humans, not Neanderthals, because they would never produce anything like this. Um, so um, we have evidence of art um, from the Paleolithic in Spain. And it was thought to be made by Neanderthals, as it was, as like it's been dated to a time long before um, anatomically modern humans were found in the region. So, um, for example, this middle picture is a cave painting, which is thought to be a ladder, um, which was found in um, La Pesenga Cave in Spain. And the animals were kind of thought to have been added later by modern humans because that's kind of what modern humans did. They would, you know, paint animals. <laughs> as well as this, there's also um, engravings that have been found that have been dated to Neanderthal age um, times, really. Um, for example, this one found in Gorham's Cave in Gibraltar. I'll now quickly just talk about the Denisovans. And they were first discovered in 2010. And... Um, they may have ranged from Siberia to Southeast Asia. They were first found in the Siberian um, Denisovan cave, well, Denisova cave, which is in Russia. And they lived sometime between, um, between um, like 76.2 thousand years ago to um, 164,000 years ago. Um, and they are known from kind of a few remains and what we know about Denisovans is mainly from DNA evidence and the DNA evidence suggests that Denisovans are related to both Neanderthals and anatomically modern humans which means that they interbred. Could have. Um, the We only have fossils of eight distinct Denisovan individuals so what we do have is quite fragmentary and it's not really like we have one full individual. Um, one like one full skeleton. We have kind of teeth here, a finger bone, dentry, and we also have one Denisovan Neanderthal hybrid, which is really cool. And Denisovans show the closest DNA relationship to modern indigenous peoples of Australia and New Guinea. Now let's move on to our own species, Homo sapiens. We first evolved in Africa, but we now live everywhere. And we first evolved roughly 300,000 years ago, um, and we now live to the present. Um, modern Homo sapiens, so anatomically modern humans, spread around the world roughly 40,000 years ago. And which means they would have met Neanderthals in Europe and Asia. And um, Homo sapiens are characterised by a lighter build of their skeletons compared to early humans. Um, we have larger brains, a kind of reorganised skull, which is um, with a thin walled high vaulted skull, so quite a high skull with a flat um, forehead. We don't really have heavy brow ridges. We have brow, brow ridge, but not heavy as a Neanderthal. And we also have kind of a prognathism, which is here, like a sticky outy bit. Um, and the jaws are also less heavily developed and we also have a lot smaller teeth. We'll just quickly go through a quick timeline just to kind of um, help with the um, kind of what's happening. So 300,000 years ago fossils were found of the earliest Homo sapiens. 
210,000 to 100,000 years ago, fossils show Homo sapiens living outside of Africa. 164,000 years ago, um, 164,000 years ago, sorry, modern humans were cooking and collecting shellfish. 90,000 yeah, 90,000 years ago, modern humans had begun making special fishing tools. Um, 60,000 to 50,000 years ago, genes as well as climate reconstruction show that they migrated out of Africa. Um, 40,000 to 15,000 years ago, genetics and fossils show that Homo sapiens became the only surviving human species. And then 2,000 years ago, Homo sapiens made the transition from producing food um, from hunter-gathering to producing food and changing our surroundings and that's kind of when um, archaeology really starts mainly I mean it's it starts more previous to that but yeah um, and 2,000 years ago is what we call the Mesolithic we have this really lovely kind of graph um, that shows all the different species that we talked about maybe some that we didn't talk about and their um, evolutionary tree and their kind of temporal range so this the bottom numbers are the millions of years before present. Now I'll talk about some major evolutionary changes that we see within the human fossil record. So a big key one that we have is bipedalism of course and this evolved much earlier in time than the other features such as larger brains and it led to a lot of anatomical changes in all parts of the human body, which we'll see on the next slide. And the first evidence of bipedalism includes some of the oldest human skeleton, uh, hominin skeletons, roughly six to four million years ago. And this is what we talked about in the late holy um, footprints, which is the trackways in volcanic ash, which dates to 3.75 million years ago. However, bipedalism, probably arose around eight to nine million years ago in the hominin line when our ancestors split from the forest dwelling Miocene apes. And we think that bipedalism evolved and arose because um, of the evolution of the savannah mosaic. So the savannah grasslands that we see um, form these patches where there was forest in a little bit and more grassland and more forest. And it was meant that bipedalism could um, allow the humans to stand up and spot uh, predators. Here we have these really lovely diagrams of the bipedalism and the skeletal changes that are associated with them. So for example the foot is a lot more flat, it's less convex and it also has a non-opposable big toe as well as straight toe bones which are known as the phalanges. Um, the angle of the knee also shifts from being more slightly splayed to being straight. Um, all of the leg bones are just generally longer. The hip joint faces downwards um, and sideways. Um, the pelvis is a lot more shorter and bowl shaped. And the spine is um, what we call sinusoidal, which means that there's a curved S shape. As well as this, the skull has these lovely occipital condyles, so kind of this sort of thing where the, um, for, in, as well as the foramen magnum, which is where the um, cervical vertebrae hits the skull. And these are placed beneath the skull in the humans, whereas with um, the apes, the skull is kind of behind the, um, with the occipital um, condyles. Another key um, change is brain size increase. So this occurred much later than bipedalism um, and the brain size increase kind of roughly occurred about two million years ago and this was solely within the genus Homo. And on average the size of primates brains is nearly double what is expected for mammals of the same body size. And we cross around seven million years the human uh, brain has tripled in size, which is just crazy to think. So in an example being in early bipedal humans, the brain size is roughly 400 to 55 um, centimetres cubed, whereas in anatomically modern humans, the brain size is 1,000 to 2,000 centimetres cubed 
um, with a mean kind of being 1,360 centimetres cubed, which is just crazy. Um, the brain case also enlarges because of this um, increase in brain size. The face becomes a lot, a lot less protruding and is placed beneath the brain. And um, a kind of solely human character is the arc of the teeth. So here in the jaws, don't have a gap between the incisors and the canines. And it's generally thought that human evolution followed a locomotion first pattern where bipedalism happened first and then the enlarged brain size occurred. We will be talking about tool use. So the first evidence of tool use is um, at least 3.3 uh, 3 million years ago. So tool use is kind of being found in in the apes and the monkeys as well. So chimpanzees are known to have created spear-like weapons for hunting, as well as um, specialist toolkits for foraging ants, which suggests our family tree may have utilized wooden tools since the ancestors of humans and chimps diverged at four million years ago. So I would definitely go have a look at um, ape tool use because the there's a video of a chimpanzee foraging for ants using a, um, twig and it dips it into the um into the ant um burrow sort of thing and gets it out and it's just covered in ants it's so cool um just the fact that it it is like that and um we kind of can tell where humans lived and where um when and when where and when early humans lived because we often find like this accumulated debris from um making and using stone tools and we know kind of stone tools are less susceptible to destruction than bones so we use a lot of stone tools and stone artifacts to know where ancient humans once were and however this kind of comes at a problem with since multiple hominin species often existing at the same time, it can be difficult to determine which species made the tools at any given site. So for example, Homo rudolfensis and, um, no, not rudolfensis, Homo heidelbergensis, sorry, and Neanderthals, um, which we talked about um, back in the slides. So um, we can kind of break tool use up into three. We have the Old Oan, which is the lower which is found in lower Paleolithic period, 2.6 to 1.7 million years ago. And the um Old Oans were simple and it's usually made with like one or a few flakes that have been chipped off by another stone. And um we found that the makers of the old um old Oan tools were mainly right-handed. And then we move to the um Arculean, which is lower Paleolithic again. However, this is 1.76 to 0.13 million years ago. And this is characterized by distinctive oval or pear-shaped hand axes and typically found within um, Homo erectus remains. However, Heidelbergensis also used um, this extensively. And then we move into the Mousterian technology, which is middle Paleolithic in age, so um, 160,000 to 40,000 years um, before present. And it's um, associated primarily with the Neanderthals in Europe, who also use this thing called Chateau Peronian technology, um, <laughs> which is also used by the earliest um, anatomically modern humans. And the Mousterian technology include hand axes, ray claws, as well as points. Here we just have this really lovely diagrams of um, different stone tools that have been used and we kind of have this general consensus that stone tools increased in complexity during the Pleistocene and the rate of increasing complexity increased in the last 200,000 years as well as this um, bone, antler and ivory tools became common after 50,000 years ago. We'll just quickly talk about migration. So as you can kind of guess, um, quite a lot of human species and homo species evolved in Africa. Um, and however, um, other species such as Neanderthals and Heidelbergensis kind of evolved out of Africa. And the record of human evolution seems to show an ever quickening pace of evolutionary trend. Um, so we talked about bipedalism in large brains and stone tools, 
The wide geographical distribution occurred roughly 2 to 1.5 million years ago. Um, fire was 1.5 million years ago. Art was 35,000 years ago. And then agriculture and the beginning of a global population increase occurred roughly 10,000 years ago. And here we just have this really lovely kind of graph um, that shows kind of when Homo sapiens came out of Africa. Um, the Americas one is a bit weird because there's um, evidence to suggest later and um, yeah, later and later. Um, so there's quite a lot of evidence that suggests that roughly it was roughly like 20,000 years ago, 24,000 years ago. But new evidence keeps coming out kind of year by year for the Americas and it just keeps getting pushed back and back and back. So I can't really give you kind of a general consensus of when they came. So yeah, it's just this really um, interesting kind of how we came to be. The um, further reading, um, I've kind of just popped, it's like two slides as well. So um, I've just popped everything kind of within groups. So for example, we've got the pre-human ape evolution, general human evolution, Neanderthals, um, other sort of um, bits uh, that you can the read, references some PDFs for this, videos that um, I've been stressing throughout the rest of the course, talk. as well as other videos that have just been really, really useful. I just want to say a massive thank you for joining me on this um this lecture series i've really enjoyed doing it with it with you guys um and i hope that you have taken a lot away from this um i know that i've loved teaching you guys um just everything about paleontology and i really hope it inspires you to do some more research maybe do some courses um read a few more books that you wouldn't usually pick up so yeah i really really want to just thank you for um joining me you can find the safe cultural heritage group on these links and then you can find me on these links i post kind of regularly about paleontology so yeah please um please give me a follow and just if i'm if you ever need me for any like queries just give me an email i'm happy to answer <laughs> So yeah, thank you so, so much. Bye guys.